The following episode of the Maui Chamber of Commerce's Business Matters was originally broadcast on March 28, 2023. It's time now for Business Matters, brought to you by Mukulele Airlines. Now here's your host, Pam Tumpop. Good morning, Pam. Hey, good morning, Gary. How's your day going? Very good so far. Oh, awesome. Glad to hear it. Well, it's another beautiful day in paradise. Uh, aloha, uh, excuse me. aloha and welcome to our guests. This morning, the Business Matters radio show sponsored by Mokulele Airlines. I'm Pamela Tumpa, president of the Maui Chamber of Commerce. And we are going to talk about great things this morning, beginning with Representative Justin Woodson talking about innovation and education and bills this legislative session. We're going to hear from Mary. Mary Alberts, the vice chair of the Hawaii Small Business Regulatory Review Board, and why this board is important in the work that they do. And we're going to talk to Preston Davis of eDesign Hawaii, so it'll be another fun-filled morning. But we're going to kick it off with Representative Justin Woodson. He was elected to serve and represent Central Maui since 2013. He currently chairs the House Committee on Education and has served in various leadership roles in the state legislature for several years. Good morning, aloha, and welcome to the show, Justin. Hi, aloha, Pam. How are you? We're great. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Representative Woodson, you have been doing an amazing job uh, representing Maui uh, County at the state legislature, and, and we appreciate all of your amazing work. And uh, you chair the House Committee on Education. So this morning we thought we'd, we'd just kind of kick off and talk about some of the innovative programs that you're seeing in education in our school system um, and how we're leveraging new opportunities like broadband. Well, thank you so much for that compliment. It really is a team effort when it comes to passing uh, quality proposals in the legislature. So I'm fortunate yes. to be a part of a very strong Maui delegation. So I'm thankful for all of them, but I'm thankful for all that help us uh, craft good pieces of legislation. And I will say, you know, just similar to kind of what we spoke about last time, I try to look at ways in which we can uh, replicate those characteristics that you see in the highest performing school systems really uh, globally. And one of the components that you do see is that they align uh, marketplace need with formalized curricula. That's good for the kids in terms of preparedness, and that's good for the overall economy. And so uh, there is a lot of innovation happening across the state uh, in our public schools. And, um, you know, first you have to try to, I think, look at where the deficiencies of skill sets are um, within any particular market. Mm -hmm. Then you have to make sure that you're partnering up with uh, private sector and nonprofit sectors. And lastly, you need to have teachers and administrators articulate uh, the standards and curricula properly to that need. And of course, uh, make sure that there are students that are interested in that particular subject matter. And so to that, I mean, there's a lot of exciting and interesting things happening around um, um, robotics. Uh, there are several SimWorks projects happening across the state. Um, our very own MEDB actually is involved. That's a statewide program. And it really excites kids and gets them uh, interested in various forms of not only robotics, but uh, things like cybersecurity, you know, learning how to, uh, how to compete against other teams um, and, and hackathons, um, and more broadly, computer science. And those skill sets are, those skill sets are ones that not only excite students, but there is, in fact, marketplace needs. Um, as an example, with a cybersecurity credential, which is happening sometimes on the mainland right now in high school, um, those individuals can make upwards to $130,000 just starting off. And that's yeah. just two years of credentialing. And so um, there's a lot of innovation happening in the computer science field, broadly speaking. 
I mean, I could speak about, you know, microbiology, um, exposure to that particular field. There's some great projects happening uh, at, at White Pahu High School, as an example. Uh, even more traditional, what I would refer to as CTE offerings, so like mechanics, auto mechanics. Um, there's some amazing work happening at Maui High School with regards to that. And so I guess the important thing is that these types of educational opportunities should be specific to the communities and in very much ways they are. Uh, and so there's a lot of different variation happening across the state, a lot of different innovations, but it's all for the benefit of our kids and our larger community. I think that's amazing. And, and one of the things you mentioned that I really appreciate that too, which is that you're trying to marry the interests, and you're, we're also looking at how it's very specific to our community. How are we doing in agritech? So there's some very um, interesting things happening in, in farm to school, broadly speaking, and um, it actually starts in the elementary level. And, uh, you know, certain schools will have, like, community gardens to where they just learn the process of farming and they learn the process of, you know, the, how the environment interplays with farming and, you know, the respect for the land. And then in the older grades, you find at secondary school, which I define as high school, um, you start to integrate some of the technical aspects. So aquaponics, again, I have to mention Waipahu High School, they have an amazing program to where they are looking at uh, agrotech practices. Um, there's there's some uh, very amazing work happening in the um, uh, um, the name of Gibson right now, but it's on the uh, windward. I'm sorry, it's on the North Shore side of uh, Wahiwa. Excuse me. <laughs> uh -huh. There's some amazing things happening <laughs> in in Wahiwa with agritech um, educational opportunities. And so uh, that is one of the spaces to where, you know, we can excel as a state. And in particular, there is an acute interest on the island of Maui and more broadly in Maui County. Yeah, I love, again, looking at DOE with the statewide models. I think that's excellent. And then finding out how we share them with the different communities. Because overall, in terms of our long-term sustainability plan, local agriculture is key. And it's always one of the top things that hits in terms of, of uh, ways that we can, you know, stop importing from someplace else and really build uh, – capacity here at home. So I'm excited to hear about some of those models as well. And I love that you're talking about, Justin, what you're looking at is looking at innovative programs worldwide and, and setting our benchmark at different levels based on what you're saying and how we relate to the marketplace. It's really exciting news to hear that. Um, you know, We've watched, and, and I've heard of my daughter as a curriculum coach and, and worked for a great school in Kansas City who had a reputation pre-COVID of graduating 100% of the students in a college prep school and getting 100% into college acceptance, or getting them into college with college acceptances. And then COVID hit, and even a school on a stellar track like that saw, you know, systems upset and, and, and are, is struggling to get back to their sort of pre-COVID levels. How are we yeah. doing in Hawaii with our educational system, knowing that we, and again, the other states are, are also seeing significant teacher shortages? How are we doing bringing our school system back up to pre-COVID levels or, or, you know, moving forward, coming on to plans to exceed pre-COVID levels? Sure, and that is an amazing goal, um, and I commend your, your daughter and her educational institutional for, for striving to, to achieve that for their kids and their futures collectively. Um, the good news is, Pamela, that uh, worldwide, actually, there has been a significant amount of learning loss. Uh, we, we know that from some of, some of the general data that has been presented to us. And uh, that is also true, unfortunately, in Hawaii. Uh, there is a significant amount of learning loss. And so um, recently, actually, the uh, Department of Education uh, contracted out a third party to look at uh, 
how much loss there was. Um, so there was a couple of, of uh, entities that were involved in that, including the Center for Assessment. And what they found was that Hawaii's learning loss was, in fact, severe. And they um, have a, a metric system to, uh, to actually articulate how they define severe. So it was severe, but again, that's not uncommon across the country and the world. Uh, the good news is, in terms of the recovery, Hawaii is doing better than other jurisdictions that they are looking at. And so this particular um, 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 nonprofit looks at uh, states on the Western Hemisphere, and, uh, you know, Hawaii was very well compared to those other Western states. So that is somewhat That's encouraging. Awesome. And they are trying yeah. to drill well, down, I love down they, on... I'm, I'm glad to know that we actually... I mean, it's a tough thing to do, <laughs> to, yes. to, but I'm glad that they contracted it out, out a report so that we can really assess and look at where we're at. And what do you think is contributing to us having a better recovery performance than some of those other regions that, that this assessments group looks at? Yeah, so we met with them. We define as the um, myself as chair of the education committee. Um, I was the superintendent and the chair of the Senate committee, and, and we asked that very specific question, as you can imagine. And uh, it's inconclusive as it stands right now. They believe that they're seeing some types of patterns. I wouldn't say correlations quite yet, but they are seeing patterns of schools that um, are just using the skill sets and tools and strategies they had in place pre-COVID to address learning loss. And so, again, just thinking back, we know that the research clearly says that if there is a particular student that is several grade levels behind or just behind in general, then it can take several years to catch up. And that the ingredients is just having a highly qualified teacher in front of that child. Uh, the more highly qualified teachers year by year are in front of that child, the more learning loss can be made up and and that student can get back to proficiencies that are consistent with his or her peers. And so the bad news is, unfortunately, is um, if you are a high school student, then of course you have shorter runway. And so right. if you are suffering learning loss, severely so, and you are in elementary school, you have more time to make that up than if you are in high school. So, yeah. um, again, there's no short answer to that, to that question, and um, people don't really know. It's not, there's no single bullet, so to speak, thus far, but it's something that we are all trying to deal with uh, together. You know, things like intensive tutoring uh, have been helpful uh, in school, after school and before school. Um, again, just linking the most severely uh, learning loss students to the most highly qualified teachers is another strategy, uh, et cetera. But we are all dealing with that together, I will say. Well, it's interesting because that's actually consistent with the school that my daughter um, is involved with. It is a college preparatory school. Is they took kids at all levels, so there was no pre-testing. And it was about, you know, highly qualified teachers and consistent tutoring to bring all students up to the same standard. So that, that mm -hmm. actually resonates with me. <laughs> I didn't sure. know that that was going to be the answer, but now listening to that, that actually resonates with me. So then that takes us back to um, teacher shortages. And all that we're trying to do with teacher shortages, I know the lieutenant governor also was looking at housing programs for teachers to help keep teachers here. Tell us about what we do to keep those highly qualified teachers here so that we can have those teachers uh, helping our kids not only catch up but excel moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, you know, teacher housing is, is a zeitgeist that is growing across the country. That is one of the tools in which many jurisdictions are looking at to attract teachers. Unfortunately, again, the teacher shortage issue is not specific to Hawaii. It is, in fact, nationwide. Uh, last year, we also tried to look at uh, the compensation aspect for educators in terms of paying them more. Um, we were able to work together with, uh, with the schools and the unions 
to provide um, uh, differential pay on a permanent right. basis for those hardest to fill areas. And so that is defined as uh, geographically hard to fill or teachers in a special education uh, arena or Hawaiian immersion. Uh, those differential pays, which is basically uh, increased pay uh, in addition to the base pay that they receive, has led to upwards to 30% um, increases in some of those specific disciplines. And so we know that that works. Uh, you know, the education piece, again, is something, I mean, the compensation piece is something that you see in highest, the highest performing public school systems defined as you need to pay teachers uh, more, as, as simply put. And again, that is also more pronounced in Hawaii because we have the highest cost of living uh, among right. any educators across the, the country. And so, um, again, no silver bullet, but housing is something that we're definitely looking at. Uh, we will continue to look at teacher compensation and we will continue to look at working conditions. And ultimately, the end goal is to have a system that adequately supports our teachers so that they can adequately support our students. That is the end game, and that's something that long-term uh, we're looking at. Well, I think you're doing an awesome job. And, and understanding what you've achieved, just even in what you just said, working with the unions on differential payment on a permanent basis, long-term contract changes that address those critical gaps, uh, that that's a you know enormous feat in and of itself because it's a different model from how they typically work. So that's very exciting to hear. And, and a great model going forward as we continue to struggle in this area. And, of course, I think everybody listening, uh, you know, our community, our state, we've all been saying we have to pay teachers more. You know, it's a, such an important profession in the lives of our children, but also in the lives of our state's long-term success. So this is a really critical piece that needs to happen. So I'm glad that you have got that front and center and are working on that. What are some of the other bills that are, were important to you this legislative session? Sure, and thank you for that. And it is always, again, a team effort. You know, um, you mentioned Lieutenant Governor Luke. She has been involved in all these efforts, and I, and I so appreciate her continued partnership. And others like, um, you know, our very own uh, Chair Kyle Yamashita has been involved in some of these discussions. So, again, it's always a team effort. Uh, and in terms of, you know, bills that are, are important, um, you know, I, I, I'm really thinking about um, HB 1329, and it's just because, unfortunately, um, again, and it's become all too common, there has been another tragedy um, on the continent with active shooters. And in this case, it was at Nashville, Tennessee. It was one shooter. Uh, it was a female shooter. She was, I think, uh, reported uh, to be 28 years old. And she snuck the life out of, you know, three uh, little kids yeah. in elementary school and three teachers. Uh, at least that's what's reported. And so we have a bill that says that we would like for the Department of Education uh, to develop active shooter training in all of our uh, DOE schools. And I know we ask our teachers to do a lot, and it's unorthodox to ask them to do more uh, from a legislative standpoint. But, you know, this is something that I think um, is necessary, unfortunately, because of the time uh, that we are living in. And so that bill, again, just simply says that the department shall work with the unions to develop an active shooter plan within all of our DOE schools. And currently we have about 83 schools that have some sort of active shooter training. Uh, the teachers that participate in that training say that they, are, they feel empowered, or they feel happy they went through it, and they feel better prepared to know what to do to protect themselves and uh, the KT that they are, are looking after and, and teaching on every single day. So that is something that's right on mind. I hope it does survive the whole legislative process. But if we require uh, uh, training for uh, fire drills, which we do, there hasn't been a death 
thankfully so since about the 60s or maybe early 70s in terms of, of, of schools across the country and uh, students dying of fires. But again, just yesterday, there was a tragedy that has happened. And I think it's like the 130th mass shooting um, that has happened this year. And yeah. we're just starting, in essence. And so that's still very important. And then very, very quickly, HB 961, that's the expansion of high-quality early learning opportunities. Again, when you look at high-performing systems, one component that they have is that their students enter into kindergarten ready to learn, cognitively, socially, emotionally, and that helps us with our uh, goal to have universal access to high-quality early learning opportunities for all three and, four, three and four-year-olds uh, whose families desire that. And so that's something that um, is a very important bill, and that proposal, in essence, provides more funding for private sector educational opportunities, public sector educational opportunities, Hawaiian immersion, pub, public sector opportunities, and charter school public sector opportunities. So very important, and we hope that that survives the process as well. Well, those are two very important bills. And, and you know, here in Hawaii, we sometimes feel that some of those things don't affect us the same way. But I remember, gosh, it seems like... I can't remember if it's a decade ago or two decades ago, but we had the IBM shooting, the, the workplace shooting in Honolulu. Right. And it reminded us all that some of the things that do happen on the mainland, you know, can be very present here. And, and we've, we're seeing other tragedies. And and um, it, I, I just I, I love how you indicated that, again, those schools where they had this active shooter training made the uh, our education, uh, the educators at that school and the leadership at that school feel empowered and feel like they know what to do. And, and that's, in any disaster, that's pretty critically important, and again, in this case, it's it's critically important because it happens so quickly, and they have to react, and to have the training so that they can react quickly and protect children is paramount. So um, thank you, Justin, for being on the show, for sharing all of this with us. Um, again, the bills that Justin Woodson mentioned, Representative Woodson talked to us about, is HB 1329 and HB 961. Please look them up. You can still ring and offer testimony online, and you can either put something in writing or you can even sign up to be heard and over a Zoom link. So, Justin, thank you for being on our show again. It's always a pleasure, and we deeply appreciate the great work you do and the great work you do with our, our Maui County and, of course, statewide legislative team. Thank you for all that you're doing to help. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity, and thank you for all you do as well. Thank you, Justin. Have a wonderful day. Yes, well. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Okay, we'll be right back after a brief message from Mokulele Airlines. Mokulele Airlines operates the largest commuter airline hub in the country, right here in Kahului. Fly Mokulele from Kahului to Molokai, Manai, Hana, Waimea, Kona, and now Hilo. Mokulele also operates the only flights between Kapalua and Honolulu. There is never a middle seat on Mokulele, and every seat has a window and aisle. Visit MokuleleAirlines.com and take your next flight from the newly renovated Mokulele Terminal. Welcome back to Business Matters. We're back, Pam. Thank you so much, Gary. And is Mary Elvis on the line? Yes, she is. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I want to tell you that Mary Elvis is a local business owner, longtime Maui Chamber of Commerce member. She owns Island Art Party out in Kihei. <clears throat> and, excuse me, for our chamber members and those interested in learning more about the chamber, she's going to have an event coming up in April. Uh, so we're excited to be out doing business matters out there in Kihei with her. But Mary is also a tremendous volunteer, serving as the vice chair of the Hawaii Small Business Regulatory Review Board. And he, she's here this morning to tell us about the Small Business Regulatory Review Board, why it was formed, and what they do. So aloha and good morning, Mary. How are you? Good. Hi, Pam. Hi. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. 
So we are so thrilled to have such a strong Maui advocate uh, as a vice chair of the Hawaii Small Business Regulatory Review Board. Can you tell us a little bit about why it was formed and what you can do to help our businesses? Sure. So uh, I'm going to shorten that name to SBRRB because it's a really (laughs) long name, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, In 1980, U.S. Congress passed the Regulatory Flexibility Act, and the purpose of that was to ensure that regulators do not burden small businesses disproportionately by imposing uniform regulations on all entities regardless of size. So in 1998, um, Hawaii's Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Act went into effect um, based on the federal act and creating the Chapter 201M. HRS, Hawaii Revised Statutes, that then um, the Small Business Regulatory Review Board uh, was then formed um, from that. So the purpose of it is to, again, help with onerous um, rules that businesses have to deal with. So how we can help those businesses is when rules in various departments are coming up and have impact on small businesses, they're supposed to submit those rules to the SBRRB um, prior to public hearing, and then we give our feedback on what kind of what kind of um, stakeholder input they've gotten so far, and then suggest make suggestions, and then we pass it. We either pass it or pass it on to public hearing or we tell them to go back and get more stakeholder feedback before they go to public hearing. Um, So that's how we can have an impact. Um, Also, if if there aren't rules for a particular um, matter, um, then a small business can submit a request for us to advocate for them. Uh, to create rules that make the playing field more fair. It is really an important role, and it really impacts both state and and counties. Yes. And so there, you know, we we see again. This is for small businesses. This is for businesses who often. You know, when you when you look at the normity of some of our national businesses, and you look at the scope, the size and scope of businesses in Maui County, right? Everybody thinks, well, oh my gosh, um, we've got by national standards a lot of micro businesses, and a lot of these rules can have tremendous impact. Uh, one of the the issues that you testified on recently that we were testifying as, on as well, and really appreciated your testimony was and which is coming up again later today, is the um, the shoreline management and SMA rules. Correct. And you found that they, you know, while the, these rules are being proposed, which are going to have tremendous impact, uh, the county hadn't submitted them for review by the SBRRB. Correct. And they still have not done so. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the, the amazing thing is we have this avenue, and, and the, the reason I want to share this with the public is this is an important avenue for small businesses to bring in. And again, there's a review. You have the Small Business Regulatory Review Board, who's reviewing these, um, which is made up by business owners. How many Correct. business? How many people are on the, the board? There's 11 people on the board. One of which is. Um, representative of DBED, so Perfect. Department of Business and Economic and Tourism Board. Yeah, so you know, we so it's meant to be something that is helpful. But if if the rules and regs are not submitted by the county or state, 
we often then find huge challenges when we get to those hearings that the, either the county or the state departments are holding. And this was one of those cases with the shoreline management and SMA rules where you had people who were impacted who were saying, hey, we didn't even get any notification on something that has significant impact over our property in these areas. Um, and right. so we really want to encourage county and state departments to work with the SBRRB. That's that's pretty hard to say, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, have to, I have to look at that. I have to write that on my, my paper so I can say that correctly, um, on these rules. So uh, tell people how they, you know, you were sharing that um, a small business – can say, you know, hey, these these are some rules that I'm coming up against that are a challenge. Uh, how can they reach out and, and talk to the Small Business Regulatory Review Board or submit something for you folks to consider taking action on? Uh, yeah, going to our website, and there's a, a place where it says <clears throat> where they can um, click a link and submit what their issue is to us. And then we will we will, we will respond. Um, an example of us doing that was when, um, and this is when beginning when time when I was on the board was with the Department of Transportation when they did a pilot program to allow Uber and Lyft um, to pick up do pickups at the airport. Right. So the taxi company submitted, you know, said, "Hey, this is not fair. We have to go through all this." Uh, rigmarole to to even operate there, and they just all of a sudden get to do it, and you have, and they have no plans to implement any rules. Right. So um, we contacted the Department of Transportation; they still didn't do anything. And then we contacted the governor, and the governor put pressure on DOT to to uh, create some rules to make the playing field more fair. And that the the thing about that is that when you do get all this stakeholder input that you can actually come up with something that everybody can at least tolerate, if not agree, fully agree on it. Um, and that's, that just gives me so much hope in humanity, right? I mean, the <laughs> process is longer. <laughs> yeah, it really does. It, it's really inspiring when that happens. When Absolutely. it happened in that case. Yeah. And, yeah, and again, it was a very unfair situation. I've talked to, I, actually, I've, I, I'm always talking, people in my family and my friends always laugh because I come home with such interesting stories talking to my taxi driver when I'm in Honolulu or Uber, Lyft. But yeah. it, when that started, that really was, again, the tax, well, while the taxi companies sort of had a monopoly of that situation, they there were payments that go to the state that have to do with that. There was regulation that was put in place. And then all of a sudden, Uber and, you know, and, the, and then within the taxi system, there's many different things and licensure and um, requirements to protect the public. And then Uber and Lyft go in and they didn't have any of those same things. So it was a lot of unfair right. competition at that moment that thankfully you folks helped to work out. Yeah. That's a great story. Can you share some other examples of some of the things that the board's been taking up? Um, one was with the um, tax department, which is one of the departments that <laughs> does not get yeah. a lot of stakeholder input, <laughs> if any at all. <laughs> oh, and we ding them on it every time they come before us. Um, um, anyways, this is regarding the film industry. Mm. So they... The, the minimum that a department has to do is post a notice in the paper 20, uh, 30 days prior to the meeting. So on September 13th, they posted that. On October 14th was the public hearing. There was some feedback, but they um, did not really incorporate much of it. On no November 7th, they got it signed, um, and then they fi got it signed by the governor November 17th was the effective date, and November 21st is when they brought it to, in front of us. Oh, my goodness. And when they brought it in front of us, they had made changes after, after the public hearing that wow. they, the people were not informed of. Oh, my yeah. goodness. And it, and it totally put, um, and, and the person at DBED that um, handles all the film industry um, requests and, and, and they, you know, they get various um, credits and, you know, it's a whole huge formula and it's all kinds of um, stuff that they go through for this. Um, because, of, because of that quick 
enactment, they had they had no time to adjust, and it made Hawaii look really bad. And all of a sudden, yeah. we had shows that no longer were happening because of this. All of a sudden, boom. And and I think you know so many times. The public is unaware of these major shifts, but we've yeah. seen so many major shifts that hamper further investment in Hawaii, uh, projects that we had. Whether you do or don't like them, the way they've cut and handled, you know, like the Hawaii Super Ferry is an example, um, the way it got handled has been a black eye on, on investment in Hawaii. Um and it has kept, you know, for years, some of the some of the technological companies and big companies that had consider, were considering Hawaii, you know, when the regulatory environment is operating in such a way that they can't count on it, they're afraid to make big investments. So to hear that, you know, uh, on a film industry that we're really trying to promote and move forward with, given its many advantages to our islands. You know, to hear that uh, the tax department was doing those kinds of things that impacted the industry is problematic because it's it's a story that gets told over and over again within the industry on the mainland and, and makes them look at other locations. Right, and which is why we're ranked 46, you know, on CNBC's 2022 annual study that, that ranks the state um, uh, for business. We're ranked 46, which is a little bit better than we were the year before, which is 49th. So, um Usually we've, we've always been the worst state or, or second to worst, so we're, yeah. it's a little bit of improvement. But it's but again, in a state, in an island state that has higher costs and is more difficult to do industry attraction and um, to sustain our residents with increased costs and, and a very great right. GET versus a state tax, you know, to be that low is still hugely problematic. It's nice that we're yeah. doing better, but still hugely problematic. Yep, exactly. Yeah, well, we, I mean, we just so appreciate the tremendous work that the Hawaii Regulatory Review Board does. Um, we appreciate you taking a strong stance. And, and I want to really encourage businesses, if you're, you know, the chamber is also a place that you can call if you're facing an issue, but you know that you've also got the Small Business Regulatory Review Board that can take this up. And, and again, the board, the Department of Business, Economic Development, Tourism, who's on the board, is a tremendous asset as well. Uh, but the board is made up of business people. So they understand. And again, as Mary said, with broad views, you guys come up with some really winning solutions. So uh, with that, did that get fixed, by the way? Or it, just, it got fixed with the tax situation with the film industry, but it was sort of after the fact. And, and we're. Yeah, I don't think it really that, got fixed. Uh, I mean, just, that challenge they had for to, years to come. They just had to adjust and go forward. We did send, we did send a letter to the governor saying that we didn't approve of the process and that we didn't approve of um, how the tax department handled it. So, um, but that's about all we can do, unfortunately. And just to be okay, clear, we so, are this is, By the way, only, uh, the Small Business Regulatory Review Board, there are often bills that come up during the course of the legislative session. And one of our goals at the Maui Chamber of Commerce is to give the Small Business Regulatory Review Board more teeth. <laughs> So, so that they have a broader impact on legislation, so that they can, you know, uh, more effectively uh, write write challenges that we see. Right. And um, so, and they work they work very hard and, and research these situations. So, it really is a labor of love. And I know that's you know, Mary, you you've been very committed to this. How many years have you been on now? Uh, I started in May of 2018, so I'm coming up on five-year anniversary. That's awesome. Well, we really yeah. appreciate um, all the work that you've done. And um, and I just want to put in a plug, too. Uh, Mary also owns Island Art Parties. And if you haven't been out to do some fun uh, painting, wh whether you have zero skill level uh, or an expert artist, you can always have fun at Island Art Parties. We do. And uh, I absolutely love it. And I have zero skill. But um, I come out with something that I'm, like, always surprised with. <laughs> 
<laughs> and people actually great want to purchase from you. I hear. Yeah, great instructors <laughs> and uh, popcorn and snacks and, and cocktails if you want them. Uh, but it's just a fun way to, to relax, create some art, and a uh, great time with family and friends. So I want to encourage everybody to go see Mary at Island Art Parties out in Kihei. And Mary, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing about the Small Business Regulatory Review Board. It's great to have you on. Thank you very much. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. You too. Bye. Thank you. Aloha. And uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Preston Davis. Uh, he is with eDesign Hawaii. They have been a chamber member for a number of years and offer a wide range of diverse services to help you in your business. And uh, when you're talking about the work they do, I'm going to leave it to Preston. But let me check and see if Preston's on with us. Uh, not yet, Pam. I'm, I'm trying to reach him right now. Okay, perfect. We have a, a, a phone line uh, limitation, so when one person goes off the phone line, because I'm actually calling in as well, we, we have to let that line go down for a second while the next person calls in, so Gary always helps us with that. But um, they are an amazing signage company and do diverse things that we have used them for, you know, not only within our business operations, but of course at the Chamber of Commerce we do many different events. We need signage for all sorts of things, and they have an array of services that can help every business look more professional and present and convey the marketing messages that you wish to convey, but also do things just uh, from helping with directional signage and other uh, other uh, signage or imagery that you might need for your business. I'm, I'm still trying to reach him, Pam, so... Uh Okay, yeah. well, while, while Gary's still trying to reach Preston, just really want to share some, maybe a little bit of what, Gary, interrupt me at any time when you've got Preston, but some of the things that the Chamber's been been working on right now, you know, this, we're gearing up for the budget session, and if you got to see earlier this week, uh, Mayor Bisson presented his budget to the county council. It was two very thick binders. Um, this is a process we've seen for quite some time, and I mean thick. Imagine, you know, binders that are about, uh, I don't know if they were six or eight inches wide, very big binders full of printed materials. And one of the things that he pointed out and council members agreed with is that it would be great to submit those electronically. It would save a ton of money because imagine you organize all this material in a binder and then you have to change a couple of pages. And you're, everybody's always working up to the last minute on these and then that changes all the page numbering and then you have to redo them and there's a lot that goes in, aside from doing all the actual budgeting work to prepare these binders. So Mayor Bisson asked if in the future they could provide electronic copies, which would allow for automatic updates. And, and um, I, I was thankful to hear, again, that something as simple, you know, we've had this technology for decades, something that simple it looks like we'll be doing next year, which is great. Um, but we're now preparing for the county council review of the budget, have a new budget chair, and Council Member Yukile Sugimura, and are excited to be working with her this year and with the Council on this year's budget. And I think there's a lot of new things happening in innovation. We're really getting to places where we're looking at priorities and plans. We're looking at, um, we've been getting a lot of calls this budget session on cross, you know, cross uh, purpose programs and how we can work together within our community. One of the questions was, for example, with our labor shortage, you know, uh, and with some programs to reintegrate prisoners into the community, how can we reintegrate prisoners working with programs that are helping our prisoners do that, that MEO has, with markets that need uh, new workers and, and people who can come and assist them in their business. So looking at what what are the parameters? How could that work? Or, or in what areas would it work best? And, and how would we then look at workforce training to gear uh, those prisoners up and prepare them for positions that they could fulfill down the road? 
So there's a lot of exciting things happening where as we are coming out of COVID and coming into new budgets with um, housing and infrastructure being uh, top priorities where we're addressing key issues like access steer and looking at access steer as a holistic and sustainable solution of something where we can address an invasive species while moving forward with creating new markets and new opportunities, we can um, create programs that span in many different arenas and across our county with Maui, Molokai, and Lanai who are having challenges with access to air. So there's a lot of exciting things that are coming up. Um, while we're doing those things on the local level, and I mentioned earlier today, is going to be a really important meeting before the Planning Commission who is addressing the shoreline management and SMA rules. And these rules are really looking at how we address managed retreat, what areas are, there's a line that's called the 3.2 line, uh, which is the setback line, and looking at properties who are in or near the setback line, understanding that, you know, we, we keep having environmental changes that are changing things, and there's a modeler that we're using to look at the entire island, actually, of Maui, and look at this modeler and make assessments on properties. Uh, currently, though, the, there's a certain challenges we feel at the Maui Chamber of Commerce with uh, we always have to start somewhere. So the modeler is, is a good tool as a starting place, but it sort of treats every area. It, it looks at where you're at in these areas, but even if you were, say, you know, uh, a mile apart, it, it kind of considers the property similar. And the properties can be very different, and so there's also a process that's called ground truthing, where you can go out and actually look at properties and see, do they have similar traits, or is there hardening in one area that another area doesn't have? Um, and, and we also haven't really started the conversation. We're putting rules in place, but we haven't also really looked yet and educated the public on mitigation measures. And we also, in terms of timing, look at the properties very similarly, where some properties are going to need, you know, remediation um, or, or managed retreat far sooner than other properties. So this is something that we at the Chamber, we had asked for a little bit more time. I know the Commission's been working on this over COVID and longer than some of us because there were some things happening that many weren't aware of, and they're wanting to move this forward, and it does need to move forward. Um, but we're also trying to ring in and provide feedback, both from the standpoint of encouraging folks who were not aware of it that affects maybe their personal property, because this will uh, impact personal property owners. And supposedly, uh, if you're in the shoreline management area, you should have gotten a notification from the planning department. And if you didn't, today's the day, because <laughs> they're going to be moving forward on rules. So if if you have a shoreline property and you did not hear about the work that's being done and, and the the rules that are being proposed, which may prevent you from doing modifications or having to move back sooner than you might be thinking about, today's the day to let them know that at the Planning Commission meeting. Um, but we're working really hard to also prepare. This is going to be something that is going to be important to us for decades to come. This is, you know, with COVID, we had a health crisis. So we had a health crisis and we had an economic crisis. This is an environmental and economic crisis. And it's something that we need to plan and prepare for. And this is not something that we're trying to kick the can down the road on. This is something that we're trying to make sure which kind of circles back to what Mary was saying, right, with the Small Business Regulatory Review. They haven't had a chance to ring in on it because, and even after reporting that the, the rules weren't submitted to the Small Business Regulatory Review Board, the planning department did, still didn't submit them to the Regulatory Review Board for review, which, given some of the um, changes in meeting time, could have easily happened before today. And so we're still concerned that many aren't aware of these rules and it could impact both personal property owners and a lot of businesses maybe who rent on Front Street that don't own on Front Street, or 
South Maui or Pai or <laughs> Hana. I mean, there's many places where um, businesses are going to be impacted, residents are going to be impacted, and we kind of need to bring everybody to the table. And in addition to it being a Maui County issue, it's also going to be a statewide issue. Other counties are dealing with this as well. So we're trying to advocate for a broader view, not necessarily in the county rules. We're going to need to come up with some, you know, our own county rules. Kauai's already come up with their rules, but did do ground choosing. And um, we're going to need, though, as a state to be looking and coming together at, on this so that we can examine who's doing what, what is working, how is it working, um, you know, where did they did they implement what they thought was a mitigation measure that wasn't as successful as somebody else's mitigation measure? This is something that is here to stay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, unless erosion control reverses and climate change, we get big shifts. And that can happen, too. They also say, of course, you know, they, they know that can happen as well. But it's something that we're going to be monitoring um, for decades to come. So it's really important that we come together, that people who are impacted have a say in the process. They're aware of it. Um, there are some things that we brought up that some of you know our industry experts in construction, when they were struggling with some valuations about you know how much can be renovated or rebuilt and to what degree and what dollar amount, some of the estimates were really low and just not based on current construction realities that we face, not only with um, supply chain issues, but rising materials costs. And so, you know, we're working to engage uh, businesses across um, our membership that had, you know, have, uh, have a sense of um, these issues and can ring in on the rules. We've put forward some red line versions ourselves. The hotel and lodging industry has put forward some expert advice to address some of the hotel concerns. And we are hoping that there's been broader reach out by the department and working with those who are individual residents. We don't Unfortunately, you know, the chamber is not going to have that list, but the county does. So we're hoping there's been broader reach out to impacted community members who live on the shoreline to let them know that these rules are coming up and to engage them in uh, understanding and where they can find the rules on, or copying them on the rules. Because today is going to be a day that we're going to see, I uh, expect a long meeting uh, with the Planning Commission, who's been working very hard on this. Um, they're, you know, they too were feeling a little frustrated, like why people didn't know. And that's not their challenge. That's We needed to make sure that we got the notifications out. Um, so the department was working on it. So there have been some questions about that. And process improvements. I think we'll continue to make process improvements on notifications. Oh, like Pam, notification. Pam, we're about one minute left here. One minute. Is that sufficient? One minute left, or, Pam. What's it, Gary? One minute. Okay. So, uh, and we don't have Preston, huh? No. Okay, I guess we'll have to we'll have to reschedule Preston, who was going to tell us about the many services they offer. Something must have happened, and um, I'm sure he's working hard, and we'll we'll learn later on, and we will invite Preston back and have him on because you know, sometimes you think of of your uh, your si your sign and design companies as as companies who do one specific thing or a couple things, and you'd be amazed at the breadth of things that they're capable of doing.